Welcome everyone. Today we will discuss about the spirit of analytic philosophy. In this, we will be tracing the background of analytic philosophy, how it emerged, the necessity of its emergence and the basic influences behind analytic philosophy. And as we have seen earlier, there is no much distinction between analytic philosophy and philosophy of language. Philosophy of language can be considered within the broader framework of analytic philosophy. And analytic philosophy being the la larger canvas, we can see philosophy of language as one of the major components of analytic philosophy. So all these features, all these backgrounds and inspirations of analytic philosophy is equally applicable to philosophy of language also. So in today's class, we are considering analytic philosophy, the tradition of analytic philosophy. Rather, it's not a single philosophy, but a mixture of different tools used for analysis and its background for the study of philosophy of language. Now, first we'll get into the origin of analytic philosophy. We'll try to trace back the origin of analytic philosophy. Okay, you have studied modern Western philosophy up to Kant and Hegel. And one of the major work of Kant, one of the influential work of Kant in epistemology is the critic of pure reason. And in his critic of pure reason, Kant claimed that genuine knowledge is synthetic a priori in nature. And before Kant, for Hume, there were only two types of knowledge. One is analytic a priori. All knowledge which you can gain through analysis, like all bachelors are unmarried or 2 plus 2 equal to 4 that is analytic and they are a priori also prior to experience also and the other type of knowledge for Hume was a posteriori posterior to experience or synthetic like rose is red is synthetic there is a synthesis of rose and redness and you can confirm it only after experience so for Hume all statements of knowledge were either a priori and analytic or a posteriori and synthetic. There were only two possibilities, either relations of ideas that is a priori or matters of facts that is a posteriori. Now, Kant brought in a third type of knowledge which is genuine, which is synthetic a priori, like the notion of causality or everything has got a cause. Everything has got a cause is known a priori to us. Without experience, we know that everything has got a cause and that is synthetic also. An event, it has got a cause. So it's synthetic in nature and it's a priori. So can proclaim that this is the genuine knowledge. The genuine knowledge is synthetic a priori and you have studied that. And uh, further description of this, the type of synthetic and analytic knowledge we will get into when we discuss logical positivism. Okay. Then this led to the possibility of producing knowledge a priori. If genuine knowledge is synthetic and a priori, then you should be able to produce such knowledge without any experience. So a system of knowledge can be constructed without any experience about the world. That's the consequence of Kant's idea and it, it was materialized in Hegel's philosophy and Hegel deduced his idealistic system, the system of absolute, ideal, uh, absolute idealism. Okay. Hegel's system, which also you have studied, that was deduced by taking inspiration from the Kantian notion of synthetic a priori and Hegel deduced his idealistic system out of pure reasoning. He used only pure ideas to develop a system, nothing, no reference to external world. Now see how a whole of philosophical system is constructed through pure reason with the help of Kant. And Hegel's philosophy was idealistic in nature. And idealism as a metaphysical theory is the belief that reality is constituted out of ideas. It's the ideas. That's the, that are the primary substances of reality. Every reality is constituted out of ideas and it's the evolution of ideas in Hegel which 
reaches at the absolute idea. So there is nothing external in the world, there is nothing empirical required for the construction of such a system, such a philosophical system. Everything was constituted out of ideas. From an epistemological standpoint, idealism is closely related to rationalism. When you see epistemologically, rationalism, you know, reason alone is sufficient to have knowledge. So through reason, through relations of ideas and reason, you can constitute knowledge. So epistemologically, the idealism is related to rationalism. Now, such a position doesn't subscribe to any reality existing outside of one's mind and thus is anti-empiricis. This is one of the important notions when, when we look from the side of analytic philosophy. Such a position where you can construct a whole philosophical system, whole theory of reality out of pure ideas. There is no need of subscribing anything in the world. Okay. The reality, there is no reality which is existing outside of one's mind because everything is constituted out of ideas. So, thus such a philosophy is anti-empiricist. They cannot claim that knowledge comes out from the world. Everything is within you. So, nothing from the external world is required for you to formulate your knowledge about reality. So, the whole of reality you understood without referring to anything in the world. Now, along with Hegel, idealists like Fichte and Schelling had metaphysical view that describes the universe. These are the German idealists you might have studied in philosophy of Kant and Hegel. Fichte and Schelling, they are German idealists who constructed systems similar to that of Hegel from pure reason or pure ideas. In the last decades of 19th century, British philosophy too was dominated by idealism of T.H. Green and F.H. Bradley, like such philosophers. They constituted or they developed their own idealistic system in British philosophy. Taking influence or being influenced by German philosophy, these philosophers, T.H. Green, F.H. Bradley and some other philosophers from Britain also subscribed to idealistic tradition. So this is the background of analytic philosophy. They claim that their theories represent the reality. This is the most controversial as far as analytic philosophy is considered. Everything is constructed through thinking, through the relations of ideas, through pure reason. For Hegel, it's evolution of reason. The real is rational and the rational is real for Hegel. And through such rationality, a whole system is const constructed and he claims that this system is reality. Now, does it have, the, does the constructed reality has got anything in correspondence with the real world or not? That they are not bothered. They claim that this constructed system is reality. And the possibility of such a system we will examine when we study Wittgenstein in detail. Okay. How far a constructed system can refer to the external world that we will study in Wittgenstein. But here, what these idealist philosophers claim is that their system, the system which they constructed out of pure ideas, refers or represent reality. This is the huge claim that they make. Now, analytic philosophy, here comes the emergence of analytic philosophy. It emerged as a revolt against such idealist metaphysics. It's a revolt, it's a fight against such an idealist metaphysics which claims that their theory represent reality without examining anything in the empirical world. Without looking into anything in the empirical world, they claim that their theory is the representation of reality. Analytic philosophy in its spirit belongs to empirical tradition. So they oppose the idealistic tradition and they subscribe to the empirical tradition that knowledge comes from the external world. Without an empirical confirmation, you cannot claim anything about true knowledge. The truth is empirically determined. So, that belongs to the empirical tradition, especially to British empiricism, because it's emerged in Great Britain, the analytic philosophy. Having the empiricist, having the empiricist spirit, it attacks idealism. So, it originated as a revolt of, revolt against idealism and it attacks idealism. Now, in the beginning of 20th century, Moore and Russell, G. E. Moore and Bernard Russell, 
more you have heard in ethics that's naturalistic philosophy when you study that's moore's philosophy now here we are not in the with ethics but is uh, contribution analytic philosophy the in the beginning of 20th century g moore and bernard russell broke out from this tradition this idealistic tradition which prevailed in britain and laid the foundation for analytic philosophy they rejected idealism and asserted realism and most philosophy is known as common sense realism they asserted realism the world is real the world exists independent of the thought you have realism is the position that reality exists independent of a perceiving mind for us idealism but in berkeley meta study idealism for idealism the reality exists in the perceiver's mind to be is to be perceived that says perceiving that's berkeley's position so to exist means to be perceived to be in someone else mind but here to exist means to exist independent of mind you now mind is required for existence so objects exist in the world independent of the perceiver's mind that's the position of realism so this uh, analytic tradition asserted realism instead of idealism this approach was positivistic in its nature we will examine positivism now so this is known as when you search for something in the world for confirmation this is known as positivism we'll get into the history of positivism now what is positivism so august comte is the philosopher who used the term positivism in the sense in which we use it now he is a 19th century philosopher 1819th century and when we call positivism it is the ism of being positive and what is positive positive the word positive can be used in many ways one is be positive that is something optimistic something happy something like that positive but here it is not in that sense that positive is used positive is used in the sense of presence what do you mean by covid positive is it something optimistic is it something good no covid positive means you see the presence of something something is present something is positive the virus is present so it is positive so positivism search for the presence of something were in the external world so for a statement to be true in positivistic tradition for a statement to be true there should be something that corresponds to the statement in the world so that's so the statement represent the world so something to exist in the world to be present in the world to be present is positive so positivism means the presence of something and when we come into the explanation that give for the observed phenomena we can see that man search for knowledge the human in if you take the human history then the history of search for knowledge has got three distinct traditions or three distinct institutions or standpoints one is that of religion the other is that of science and the third one is the in between position that of philosophy so there are three traditions of knowledge religion philosophy and science and if you trace back to the history of the explanations given for uh, the phenomena in the world you can see that according to comte you can see that this has progressed through three distinct stages whenever there is right whenever there is flood or whenever there is earthquake the explanation given initially in the ancient civilization that was of mythological in nature or theological in nature they brought god to explain all these things or some sort of supernatural powers gods or heroes or using myth they explain this phenomena so the explanation was theological or mythological in nature so there is a quest for explanation something for something to happen there must be a reason what's the reason god is the reason or eros are the reason or some like such a supernatural agent is the reason that's the first stage the theological stage in the second level there is a metaphysical explanation that's more philosophical in nature that you can see from thales onwards there is an axiom and an axiom means for everything they explain in terms of some of the metaphysical principles so that's the second explanation and at the third level we have got scientific explanation that's naturalistic explanation for anything to be explained that must be in the world 
There is a causal connection between what you observe and what is existing in the world. There is no supernatural power in the world which creates such phenomena. Every phenomena you observe is created out of the nature itself. So it subscribes not to supernaturalism of theology but to the naturalism of science. So if you trace that development, you can see that there is a transition from supernatural to abstract to natural. Supernatural as far as theology is considered and abstract as far as metaphysical is considered and scientific as far as or natural as far as scientific is considered. So there is a shift from supernatural to natural explanation. Now, where will you look for evidence now? In the scientific era, you have to look in the external world. So, positivism asserted that the empirical evidence is necessary for any knowledge claim. If it's not relations of ideas, as that of mathematics, 2 plus 2 equal to 4, if it is something connected with reality, when you talk about reality, then there must be some empirical evidence. For a statement to be true, for a statement to be meaningful, there must be something corresponding to it in the world, in the empirical world. Then only it can have meaning or it can claim some sort of truth. The more details we will study when we come to logical positivism. Following this, analytic philosophers rejected the idealist metaphysics. So there is nothing meaningful in the idealist metaphysics. They rejected that and they subscribed to positivism. In fact, they are against all sorts of deductive metaphysics. What's a deductive metaphysics? As you have studied in Hegel, that from a pure idea you are developing a system of philosophy, a, a system of reality, deductively, like formal logic. In Spinoza also the same thing happens. In Spinoza's ethics, from some axioms he is bringing, he is making his vision of reality. So this idealist, this analytic tradition, is against such deductive metaphysics. Now, analytic philosophers use analysis as a tool for doing philosophy. Now, what's done in analytic philosophy is actually the analysis of language. More details we'll get into when we study the characteristics of analytic philosophy. This is only an introduction to analytic philosophy. Okay, so we use analysis using language. We analyze using language as a tool. So the analysis is a tool of philosophy. In analysis, we get into components of each, the issue in hand. If the thing is something complex, then we make it into pieces and analyze it. And we get into the details of that and see how the relations are made or how the statement is made. So we are getting into the details in analytic philosophy. Another great influence, one great influence we are seeing that is positivism. Now another great influence on analytic philosophy is the development of symbolic logic. Actually, starting from Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein, they use symbolic logic to represent statements in ordinary language. Symbolic logic enables us to have precise, clear, and unambiguous understanding of propositions. In propositional logic, you have treated the proposition as a whole. In predicate logic or in quantification, you will be treating propositions by getting inside it, what is the true relation, how a proposition is made. Apparently the proposition may be a disjunctive one or a conjunctive one and inside it is a disjunction. So there is a difference between what is apparent, the details we will take up when we take Russell. Okay. So the grammar which you see superficially may not be the real grammar of that statement. So to move from the surface grammar to the grammar is achieved through the utilization of symbolic logic. It enables us to get into the dub grammar of statements used. Instead of the surface grammar, what is apparent, what is superficial, what you can see on surface, instead of that there is a deeper meaning for statements. And if you get into the deeper meaning of such statements, much of the philosophical problems can be solved. You will find that the Philosophical problems are arised out of incorrect understanding of the statement. A correct understanding can be made by getting into the depth grammar of that statement. And symbolic logic actually, especially quantification, allows us to get into the deeper meaning of a statement. This approach enables 
analytic philosophers to have clear understanding of the philosophical issues. We can dig into the problem, the real problem, and show that in effect there is no problem. That those aspects we will study when we examine Wittgenstein. Okay, hence we can conclude that analytic philosophies against idealism, as we have seen, it's a revolt against idealism, and against deductive metaphysics, which again is constructed out of pure reason and it's empiricist in nature. It asks for evidence in the external world and it is realistic. It believes in the existence of world independent of a perceiving mind. And the two major influences of it, the two major influences of analytic philosophy are positivism and symbolic logic. So we have seen the background of analytic philosophy from Kant's critic of pure reason where synthetic a priori is possible or its genuine knowledge and that made possible for Hegel to construct his idealistic system along with other idealist philosophers and this they claim that their philosophy or their system is the representation of reality and without referring anything in the external world. And idealism, sorry, analytic philosophy is a revolt against such a philosophical position and it asserts in positivism and it gets into the deeper aspects of statements and its meaning using symbolic logic. That's all for today. In the next class, we'll be getting into the contents of the syllabus. Till then, bye. Thank you.